So we slice the midbrain like a ham. You can see that in this top picture up here. See that black line? So this is what it looks like, okay? The tegmentum is the floor of the midbrain. It also consists of ascending tracts. Remember, ascending is just a road. It's carrying information from my body up to my brain, my spinal cord up to my brain. You've got the red nuclei, these little dudes right here, okay? And they are involved in the unconscious regulation and coordination of motor activities. Basically, you're walking down the hall, you're not really thinking about your balance or your movement or anything like that. You're just going, you're just moving. Um, a lot of that becomes muscle memory where you're not thinking a lot about what's happening. You're just doing it because you already know what it means. That's unconscious regulation. The cerebral penduncles, that's these guys down here. They're the descending tracks, basically carrying motor information from your brain down into your spinal cord. Again, it's a road that connects. The substantia nigra, that's these guys here, they kind of look like sharpie eyebrows. They're actually involved in muscle tone and coordinating movements. So how tight our muscles are contracting and being able to move the way that we need to to get the action that we want. The reason that we call them the substantia nigra is because, believe it or not, they actually do have quite a few melanin granules in them, making them very, very dark. Now, the reticular formation. The thing about the reticular formation that makes it kind of complex to talk about is that it isn't in one spot. It actually is scattered throughout the brain stem, but it does control cyclic activities, meaning things that we kind of do and cycle through, like going to sleep and waking up, going to sleep and waking up. Those types of cyclic activities are actually controlled by that reticular formation. And we're going to discuss that in more detail in chapter 14, just so you know it is upcoming. Now, the cerebellum, this little dude back here. So it communicates via three large tracks. Remember, tracks are just pathways. Um, you've got the superior cerebellar penduncle, the middle cerebellar penduncle, and the inferior cerebellar penduncle. And if you think about the three parts of the brain stem, you've got the midbrain, midbrain at the top, you've got the pons in the middle, and you've got the medulla oblongata at the bottom, right? Everybody with me, I hope? The superior tract penduncle I'm talking about does communication with the midbrain, the middle, the pons, and the inferior with the medulla oblongata. Literally, we are connecting our cerebellum, this little dude back here, with the parts of the brainstem, and we've named them according to which part I'm communicating with. So superior, that's where the midbrain is, right? So it connects to the midbrain. Middle is where the pons is, that's what connects to the pons. Medulla oblongata is the bottom, the inferior connects with the medulla oblongata. Now something that's kind of interesting, it has a gray cortex and a white medulla. Remember, medulla always means middle, cortex always means outside. So if you look at this picture, See how the tree looking piece in the middle is white? You can actually see that, right? And the outside looks darker. That's because the inside, the tree looking part is white matter and the outside, the leaves of that tree are going to be the gray matter. So um, we've got the folia, which are all of these little folds that you have out here. And then you've got that center piece that looks like a tree called the arbor vitae. Arbor vitae, arbor day is about trees, okay? So the arbor vitae is going to be that part internally that looks like a tree. You do have nuclei where cells are basically 
attaching to the other cells located deep in the inferior center of that white matter as well. So the cerebellum, which translated means little brain, actually has 10 trillion more neurons than the entire cerebral cortex. So in this little thing back here, we have 10 trillion more neurons than this whole big pink thing up here. Just to kind of give you an idea of how busy this part of your brain is. There are three parts to this. The floccula nodular lobe, which basically helps control your balance and your eye movements. Again, if I whack somebody in the back of the head with a lamp and they start the dramatic steppy thing that you see on telenovelas, well, this helps control your balance. If you hit it with a lamp, it's not going to enjoy it. You also have the vermis. That's this kind of little area that connects the two halves together. It's actually involved in the control of posture locomotion, how you are standing when you're walking, um, and fine motor coordination. So being able to pick up a dime, being able to write um, and control your fingers enough, being able to type on your phone if you're trying to text somebody, that's fine motor control. And it's going to help to produce very smooth flowing movements. You know when something's wrong with this because people tend to have very spastic movements. <clears throat> the two lateral hemispheres, there's one, there's the other, they function together with the frontal lobes of the cerebral cortex in planning, practicing, and learning complex movements. So the frontal cortex, that's this right here, this part of your brain, okay? So <clears throat> they function with that to make sure that what you planned and what you did match. If they don't, this is the part that actually helps to kind of correct that. And learning complex movements, things like actually writing or um, playing a piano or playing baseball, these are complex movements. I have no hand-eye coordination. I can't hit a baseball to save my life. Now the diencephalon, this thing in here, this green thing that you can see, Okay, see it right there? <sighs> okay. So it's part of the brain. It's located between the brain stem and the cerebrum. Um, so imagine again that Tootsie Pop, right? And you've got the Tootsie Roll with the sucker on the end. This is kind of the center of where everything is before you get to that cerebrum, the big pink part on top. It has four main components, the thalamus, the subthalamus, the epithalamus, and the hypothalamus. So the thalamus, if I were to take everything away, this is what the thalamus would look like. You can see right here that there's kind of this connection between the two sides. You call it the interthalamic adhesion. But here, all I've done is I've cut this right down the midline of the body where the nose is. So you're kind of looking at it from the side. So you have two lateral portions, one on the right, one on the left, and they're connected by that small stalk called the interthalamic adhesion. In between these two halves, do you see how there's kind of a fold here? There's actually space in there. They're not connected to each other all the way down, just at that interthalamic adhesion. This is actually called the third ventricle, okay? The third ventricle is that space between the two lobes. Now, why is that important? Because cerebral spinal fluid actually circulates in that space. Remember our substitute blood supply? That's actually in that space. All sensory neurons that project into the cerebrum uh, I'm sorry, all sensory neurons that project into the cerebrum must synapse in the thalamus. In other words, this is my relay center. This is where I connect to get to my next place. It's kind of like if you're traveling out of corpus, you either connect in Houston or you connect in Dallas to get to the bigger places, right? You don't usually have direct flights from corpus to somewhere else. Well, if I'm coming from down here, I have to connect somewhere here to get to wherever my next destination is. Because of that, we call it the sensory relay center. Now, um, what relays through what region? 
who is my connecting point? So the medial geniculate nucleus, hang on one second. The medial geniculate nucleus carries auditory information, so sound. The lateral geniculate nucleus carries visual information, so vision. The ventral posterior nucleus. Um, most other sensory impulses go through here. Things like pain, touch, pressure, itch. That's where this is going to relay through, okay? Um, ventral anterior and lateral nuclei, these are involved with motor functions. In other words, movement. I want to move my arm. This is my relay center. Um, communication as well between the basal nuclei and the cerebellum and the motor cortex. So the cerebellum, the broccoli stems in the back, the motor cortex, which we're going to talk about eventually, but it's the part of your brain that controls your movement and the basal nuclei, which is actually part of in part controlling your movement as well which we'll talk about the anterior okay moods actions associated with strong emotions so we tend to take physical action sometimes when we've had a strong emotion when we've had an experience right well if you really like somebody you might go up and talk to them if you are really angry you might swing out and punch somebody if you're scared you might run our moods do influence our actions so these are the relay centers in the thalamus that carry that for us so the anterior and middle medial i'm sorry nuclei they are connected to the limbic system see that word right there limbic anytime you see the word limbic your brain should automatically say emotions because the limbic system is part of our emotional brain, as well as the prefrontal cortex. They're also involved in mood modification. So anybody who's ever worked in retail, you know that one customer that used to come in that would drive you crazy. But did you turn around and go, shut up, shut up, shut up? Of course not. You wanted to make a sale. So yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, of course, I'll, I'm happy to help you. What did you need? Oh, yes, that's mood modification. Even though you would prefer to scream at them and tell them to get out of your face, you modify your mood because you know that you have to. The lateral dorsal nuclei, whoops. Man, I tell you, I'm terrible with this pen. Um, it is connected to other thalamic nuclei and the cerebral cortex. This is involved in regulating emotions. In other words, I'm still having my emotions. I'm just making sure they don't get out of control. So, for example, you get mad at your kid. You don't turn around and, why do you have to be such a, right? You turn around and go, you can try this here. But remember, you're going home with me. They know they're in trouble. I knew I was in trouble. My mom would do that. Oh, yeah, sure did. But she didn't lose her head over it. It's regulation, bringing it down. Now, the lateral posterior nuclei and the pulvinar, um, they're involved in sensory integration. In other words, I'm feeling something. Is it a good feeling? Is it a bad feeling? Do I need to move? Um, I'm feeling pressure. Is it good pressure? Is it bad pressure? Is something crushing my foot or is my boyfriend, you know, squeezing my hand? That type of thing. It's not just about the feeling, but like the, the sense of pressure. It's about the feeling behind it. Do I like it? Do I not like it? That type of integration. Now, the subthalamus. So the subthalamus is actually here. Okay, so my thalamus was this bit up here. The subthalamus is right below it, right here. It's a small area um, in, well, immediately inferior to the thalamus that's associated with the basal nuclei and controlling motor functions. So this is about movement. It contains ascending and descending tracks. Again, not surprising if this is the one part of my brain that connects the top part of my brain to the rest of my body, there have to be roads going through it. And it has the subthalamic nuclei. Now the epithalamus, that's back here, okay? Well, actually not all the way up there, but back here. 
You've got the habanula and you've got the pineal body. That's what makes the epithalamus, okay? It's a small area superior and posterior, so behind the thalamus. The habanular nucleus, or the habanula, is influenced by smell and involved in emotional and visceral responses to odor. So the best way that I can think to describe this to you, my mom wears white diamonds perfume. She's worn it since I was like 13, so that's like 30 something years now. To be honest, I smell white diamonds and I think of my mom. And that emotional response of, oh, it's my mom. That's the emotional response to odor. Now let me go completely opposite of that. Let's say that you're, you know, in town, you're in San Antonio and you get mugged and the mugger is wearing a very specific type of cologne and during the mugging he had a gun to your head was telling you he was going to hurt you and your family and everybody else right that experience was a very emotional experience it might be 10 years later and you're in a bank and there's this little old viejito old man with a walker and you know this is not the guy that robbed you or mugged you if he's wearing that same cologne though, that same smell, you might feel that <gasps> anxious, oh my gosh, what's happening? You might feel that. That's the same thing. It's an emotional response to the smell, to the odor. Now the pineal body, um, and it is pineal, not penal, just FYI. We don't know, to be honest. We know what it does in animals very well. It actually controls their sleep-wake cycle and their biorhythms based on the sunlight and where the planet is and all that. We know that. In humans though, it's not that simple. We have people who work graveyard shifts. Technically, humans are diurnal. We should be awake when the sun is out. But there are people that work graveyard shifts. Also with animals, if I want animals to go to sleep and they're nocturnal, all I do is turn on the lights. Automatically, they're like, <sighs> they're out. In fact, when you work in an animal room, you make it so that they're asleep when you're working. That way they're more docile while you're working with them. So humans don't do that. If we did, we would be really upset going to the movie theater because the minute the lights went down, we would fall asleep. So that doesn't really hold water what we do know though okay if children get tumors on their pineal gland one of two things happen either they go through puberty really really early we're talking six seven years old and they're going through puberty or they don't go through puberty at all so we think it has something to do with the onset of puberty how we don't know yet. We haven't connected all the dots. So the hypothalamus, that's this down here where all the skittles are, okay? This is the most inferior portion of the diencephalon and it contains several nuclei and tracts with very diverse functions. So the autonomic function, remember autonomic is self-controlled. Parasympathetic and sympathetic. It controls your heart rate, it controls urine release, movement of food through the GI tract, and blood vessel diameter. So again, very, very essential functions. Endocrine function, there are regions in the hypothalamus that produce antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. It also helps to regulate the pituitary gland. That's this gland down here. Okay, this is endocrine function. Endocrine system is hormones. Both ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin are hormones. And the pituitary gland is responsible for releasing a multitude of hormones. And this dude up here is responsible for controlling that dude down there. Muscle control. It controls muscles involved in things like swallowing, and it's part of what stimulates us to shiver when we're cold temperature regulation so literally we've got a thermostat in our hypothalamus if that part of our hypothalamus gets warm it promotes us to sweat 
so that we experience heat loss. If it gets cold, if that part of the hypothalamus drops, it promotes heat production. In other words, we start shivering. We start moving our muscles and breaking down all that ATP so that our body will warm up. Another part regulates our food and our water intake. The hunger center gets stimulated, we want to eat. The satiety center gets stimulated. Satiety means satisfied. It inhibits us from eating. The thirst center, it promotes water intake. Now I know you're probably going, I'd rather have a Coke or I'd rather have a Dr. Pepper or whatever, but if you think back to the days when we were cave people, the only thing available was water. So the thirst center is about drinking water. Emotionally. A large range of effects on emotions happen in our hypothalamus. It can be related to um, things like stress-related illness. You know how when you get super, super stressed out is like the perfect time for you to get sick. Of course it is. Yeah, no. This is part of that. Psychosomatic illness. Hello, where, where is my pen? Psychosomatic illness. This is... You think you're sick, but you're not. Everybody has that person who's a hypochondriac who hears about something on the news and goes, oh my God, I have that. Yeah, that's psychosomatic. You're not actually ill. You just think you are. Feelings of rage and fear. Those are some strong and powerful emotions. And part of that is part of your hypothalamus. Regulation of the sleep-wake cycle. It coordinates the responses to sleep, to the sleep-wake cycle. Basically that kind of turnover. Sexual development and behavior. It stimulates sexual development in your body. In other words, the, the development of your ovaries or your testes and your breasts and all of that, as well as arousal and behavior. 